Trustees, President Prevett, Dean Calperi, faculty and staff of the university, families, friends, and fellow graduates. <coughs> Good afternoon. About 30 years ago, I discovered that I was a hopeless idealist. I was bent on changing the world and doing that by tackling the global water and sanitation crisis. And in addition to being an idealist, I was also a young civil engineering student, and I was analytical, and I loved to solve problems. Over the years, I've learned to embrace that idealism, that idealistic side of me, as well as embracing the geeky engineer inside. And today, as a commencement speaker, I feel compelled to offer some advice, of course. But fortunately for you, I limited myself to two pieces, one coming from the idealist and the other coming from the geeky engineer. So first, from the idealist, I believe that your life should be about finding the intersection of your greatest passion and the world's greatest needs. I've heard that in many places over the years, and I've really adopted that as one of my mantras that I try to, to live by. Second, from the engineer, Deke, you should dare to be orthogonal in how you strive to make an impact in your work and in your world. Now, of course, each of those begs for an explanation, particularly the second. So let me do that in the context of my efforts to tackle the global water and sanitation crisis. So, as mentioned, I took this trip to Guatemala when I was an undergrad. That trip forever changed my life. I was there as a volunteer on a construction project, but I had the opportunity to take a side trip to the slums of Guatemala City. And I was appalled. The conditions that people were living in were unimaginable. I remember particularly one young girl who was dipping her bucket into this contaminated barrel of water, collecting water for her family, carrying it back home to these lanes, these dirt muddy lanes that were filled, filled with sewage. And I was struck by the fact that I was a two-hour plane ride from home, and the world still existed like this for billions of people. So when I did return home, I started to look at the macro issues around this. I got the micro of that girl and the impression she had on me, but what was happening at a global level? And I was shocked to learn that nearly a billion of us didn't have access to safe water. Two and a half billion of us didn't have access to a basic toilet or even a pit latrine. 200 billion hours were being spent every day by women walking to collect water. 443 billion school days lost every year because of water-related disease. And three and a half billion, or three and a half million deaths every day, mostly among children under age five, every year because of water-related disease. This is down to me. We had known how to make water safe here for more than 100 years. We could get it done, and yet this juxtaposition existed. Imagine, if you will, that we discovered the cure for AIDS today, and 100 years from now, 3.5 million people were still dying that disease. So this gets back to that first point. I had found the intersection of my passion as a civil engineer, problem solver, and one of the world's greatest needs, the global water crisis. Now, to a newly minted civil engineer, this seems pretty straightforward, right? You've got to drill a lot of wells. You've got to build a lot of infrastructure. You just have to go out and get it done. But what I found was that this charity-led approach of raising funds to build the infrastructure, to drill the, well, the wells, wasn't working. At that time, about half of water projects around the world were failing, largely because it was top-down. Projects were done for people instead of with them. Instead of engaging them, they were handed water projects. I also realized at that time that there was never going to be enough charity in the world to get water and sanitation to everyone that needs it. There was this incredible sense of disconnect with the vision of everyone having safe water and sanitation. 
So this leads me to that second piece of the advice, and that is the need to be orthogonal. Now I know that uh, the math majors graduated earlier today. So orthogonal simply means lines or forces that intersect at in a 90 degree angle. They just go right past each other. In the world of ideas, orthogonal to me means trying to take the problem that you're solving and find those other forces, those other ideas that normally just cast right by. But you bend those forces, you bend those ideas toward the problem that you're trying to solve, looking for solutions in unexpected places. I think a good example of this is TED. Anybody that's been to the conference or watched the TED videos gets this, that you look to TED not to find out new ideas within your domain about how to incrementally change something. You tune into the TED videos because you see those orthogonal ideas presented, those things that seem unrelated to the problem that you're solving, so that if you bend them a few degrees, they can be incredibly powerful in helping you make change. So going back to the water and sanitation crisis and this orthogonal concept, so the conventional wisdom in the space was that all the poor were too poor to pay for their own water and sanitation solutions. The poor were destined to be beneficiaries of top-down charity. That's how we were approaching the problem. This completely collided with what I saw when I traveled the world, when I was in the slums, when I was in the villages. I met people who were paying 25% of their income to secure water, the private water vendors in their neighborhood because they couldn't afford to connect to the public utility. These water vendors owned and sold the water. They were known as the water mafia. And people were paying them huge amounts of money. I met a woman in Bangalore, in India, who paid 125% interest to a loan shark so that she could build a toilet at her home. So she would no longer have to wait for the cover of darkness to go out along the riverbank to defecate. I met women who were spending six hours a day walking to collect water, waiting in line for water in urban taps, spending time that they could have otherwise been working and paying jobs. So this was a huge disconnect between the conventional wisdom and what I was seeing. And to me, it screamed for an orthogonal solution. That insight, that approach, that really shifted the way Water by Water approaches this, was that instead of that well drilling directly, what if we could help the poor get access to the right financial tools to help them escape the water mafia and the long term? <coughs> so in 2003, we began to bend the orthogonal course of microfinance to water and sanitation solutions. We created something called water credit. And up until this time, microfinance was out there in an orthogonal way. There was nothing in our between microfinance and water and sanitation. So we had to convert, convince the microfinance institutions to get in the game, to develop loan portfolios. And it was a challenge. They were skeptical. They couldn't connect the dots between people getting water and toilets and repaying loans. We helped them to do that. We covered their startup costs to launch these new loan portfolios. And what we found was pretty amazing. People started taking loans. 85% of the people taking loans were women. They were taking loans for about $100 so that they could pay to get a water connection, pay the connection fee to the local utilities. They didn't have $100 in their pocket all at once, so they needed a loan that they could pay back over two years. They got their water connection. They had water right in their homes. They were saving time. They could spend that time working at jobs. They were taking out loans for $150 to build a toilet. So this took off. So where are we today with water credit? and the bending of these orthogonal forces. So we tapped into venture philanthropy, something that was started to emerge at the time. People looking to the markets, looking to new ways to solve the problems of poverty. We secured $24 million in philanthropic capital that's now projected to allow us to leverage $75 million in commercial capital. 